everyone. Hello again. Thank you all so much for being here, um, both in person and online. Uh, this week's discussion is on um, Saicho and Kukai, and it, it's a, an influential and interesting um, stepping stone for Japanese Buddhism on the whole. Uh, so, uh, before I begin, disclaimer, uh, I, I'm just telling a story. Uh, there are a lot of details to any given moment along this turn of events uh, that I'm about to relay, so I'm not covering it all. Uh, there's always massive generalizations, so bear with me. Uh, this is just a fascinating story, so we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, I would probably help to maybe turn it on. Yeah. Okay. Um, in discussing Nara Buddhism a couple months ago, we saw what effect Buddhism had on um, uh, had on Japan. And by the seventh and eighth centuries, it had spread widely, embedding itself within the cultural perspectives, and provided a new social network of governing. The systemic structure of Nara Buddhism provided a way to ad administer over the teachings and the clergy. The structure also provided financial and political power and influence. And in time, what was gained in power and prestige was invariably its downfall. We also discuss how Buddhist movements were also happening outside of the Nara system unregistered, unsanctioned priests uh, out in the countryside, basic being mountain ascetics. They were not bound by any administration, but also not supported and often publicly criticized. But for the local gentry, they were pivotal teachers, healers, mystics uh, in their respective areas. And they were not bound by, uh, by the administration. And so in this way, we can see how Buddhism in Japan had to this point become too big to fail. With, with the advent of the Heian era in 794, enter into the scene young Emperor Kamu, and he needs to maintain and stabilize the nation. And to take a new perspective on Buddhism's role for doing just that. And here steps in our two protagonists, Saicho and Kukai, Dengyo Daishi and Kobo Daishi, um, respectively, as their posthumous names. Together, these characters go on to set the tone for Japanese Buddhism into the future. These main characters are worthy of semester-long courses un uh, unto themselves individually, but for our part, let's get a general sense of who each of these protagonists are. So Saicho was ordained a novice at Todaiji in Nara, um, the head Nara temple at the age of 13 and took full ordination by 18. He would have had been formally educated as a monk from an early age and very much raised within the system, if you might say. And it, it, it is this ascribed nature of state Buddhism that was not as appealing to a young Saicho. And in 785, within months of being ordained at 18, he was sent out to Omi Kokubunji, the state-sponsored temple of the Omi prefecture, just outside of Kyoto, now what is now Kyoto. Um, and he, within months, he had run away into the mountains nearby, being Mount Hie, uh, and started a mountain retreat. He had seen the lack of serious practice and study within Nara and sought to fully immerse himself into the practice. He made, he made five now renowned vows and would not descend the mountain from, uh, from the mountain until he had completed and maintained those vows, all in the name of dedicating his practice to the benefit of others and the benefit of the nation. He studied the Lotus Sutra, the Heart Sutra, and eventually Tantai teachings, especially Juri's Makashikan, the Moho Jiguan, um, the Great Concentration and Contemplation, and Juri's Lotus Sutra commentary. In 12 years time, 7, uh, 798, he had fully embraced Tantai teachings, the, the Tendai teachings, uh, alliterated into Japanese, and had become an appointed court priest. The, through lectures uh, like that on a threefold Lotus Sutra, uh, Saicho gained the attention of Emperor Kamu. And in 804, he was on a road trip to China, sponsored by the court. He returned only nine months later, 
and had received instruction on Tiantai doctrine, taken additional Mahayana precepts, and was also initiated into certain esoteric, uh, esoteric Buddhist teachings as well. Foreshadowing. Okay. Then Kukai, on the other hand, you might consider him a complete, op not opposite, but just very different, just completely different from Saicho. He came to Buddhism very late um, in his life, being raised otherwise in an affluent middle society family. One can, um, uh, uh, one in which led administratively on a local level. And so he saw both ends of the social strata, um, both uh, prestigious and the downtrodden. He was formally taught not in Buddhist orthodoxy, but in governmental orthodoxy. He was a shoe in and had great prospects. He was he had great social promise. He was on track to receive a high position position job in government. But around the age of seven, 17 or 18, um, he suddenly turns away from it and also flees into the mountains. These are the Shikoku, Shikoku Mountains, um, it's a Shikoku Island area. He finds a spiritual home in, in the other end of Japan's Buddhism. Um, and with all of those outside of the Nara system uh, of registered ordained clergy. Again, these practitioners considered outside the Buddhist structure and were and many were ascetics, cultivating Buddhism in much more of a grassroots kind of way, if I can play on the analogy. Much of the Buddhism Kukai practice would have been heavily influenced by Shinto and even Taoist influences. Elements of chanting, visualizations, magic and asceticism were commonplace in these practices. And thus, having been influenced in such a way, Kukai's lured away from his former life and became an austere, devoted ascetic. And, his, and this manifested mostly as pilgrimages across the Shikoku Island, conducting rites, reciting mantra, while seeking religious insight and spiritual powers. The aim was not for a life as a priest in one of the official temples, but his was, it was a life of a lay believer, living in accordance with the way. During this time uh, is when he come in, co comes in contact with the Dainichi Kyo, the Mahavarachana Sutra, which later becomes Shingon's uh, uh, seminal text. It's focused on Dainichi Nyorai, Mahavarachana, shocker. Um, Dainichi Nyorai is the root Buddha, and the doctrine states that within one's present life, one can become, not become, uh, one can take a non-dual form, kind of, again, kind of that idea of uncovering, unifying with the Buddha, becoming a Buddha, and thus attain a union with the Dharma body. The implication here is that all other Buddha forms are just emanations of the root Buddha, of Dainichi Nyore. So that figure can be considered the Dharma body, the fabric of the cosmos, the absolute. The teaching was present in Nara, but no single orthodox school of uh, esotericism had been formed yet. Many of these, the teachings similar to this might be found in more predominantly in the, uh, the Naran Hoso school. Uh, which was more Yogi Charan at the time. This is the mind only style and school set of teachings. It's, it is the focusing of the body, speech, and mind to dissolve the self and, and seeing more clearly into the nature of reality. Um, and it's, you, one can understand it has a very powerful and influential message for those of the court at that time. So back to Kukai, he's practicing in Shikoku, then out of nowhere, in 804, he takes novice um, ordination. A couple months later, he's now taking fully ordained uh, uh, vows. And same year, 804, he's on the same trip with Saicho to China. Now, what's fascinating is that there is, um, it's stated that there's very little scholarly information about why or how <laughs> this actually happened. Um, because it's fairly phenomenal that a lay ascetic all of a sudden has the prestige of being ordained in a year and taking on a, tri a trip to from Japan to the Tang Dynasty's capital, you know. Um, 
So one might assume that there may have been other family members of Kukai in government administration who could have gotten him away into this power provision, powerful position of imperial court priest. I'll say that 10 times fast. Mm -hmm. um, one can also assume that if the authentic esoteric teachings being found in China, Kukai was going to go and learn them. And consequently, his focus for, uh, for going was on receiving esoteric teachings and initiations. And he does just that. Studying under the direct, a direct lineage that originated in North India during the 7th century CE, he receives initiations into both the Vajra and Womb realm mandalas. These are the Taizokai and Kongokai uh, mandalas that we have in our Hondo right now. Um, and they are fairly common within Tendai and Shingon, both. The ideas of compassion, Taizokai, and wisdom, uh, Kongokai. And in 806, a couple of years later, he returns bringing back writings, also imagery, uh, implements, uh, esoteric implements, mandalas, Buddhist relics, etc. So they, they've set off to China, they receive their respective teachings, they study for a time, and then they come home. Bring, the, the bringing back of what they had, therefore, helped to lay out what was to come after the return. Saicho returned to Japan first, and he went and reported to the emperor. But he was received <coughs> as a teacher of not Tiantai or Tendai teachings, but as, as an, uh, but for his esoteric doctrine. Remember, um, remember that small little esoteric initiation that he had? Soon after, the emperor commissioned an esoteric ordination platform to be built. Because it was clear uh, for the, uh, what the emperor's intentions were. And yet, for Saicho, he was really set uh, on his work to formally establish Mount Hiei and cultivate the Tendai teachings. Saicho did do what he could to perform the esoteric rites at that time, at least to appease the court, as a way to start the petitioning for sponsored Tendai priests. By 806, it was decreed that he would formally receive two annual ordinances for the Tendai sect. Now, I should, as, a, as an aside here, I should mention, that's a big deal. Any, any state-sponsored priest um, were, were very regulated because the court didn't want too many of them. They didn't want to have so many priests escaping society as a way to get rich by joining the Buddhist order. Right? All that power and prestige. So receiving out of their yearly allotment, Tendai receiving two of those, and all the rest being for Naran, Naran schools, was a big deal. However, um, it, it, they didn't actually arrive until 810, when the death of, with the death of Emperor Kamu, and then inaction by his successor, Emperor uh, Heizei. Furthermore, those ordinances would also be split up one Shikan or Tendai study, and one for Mikyo study. So not even a Tendai priest per se, although yes. So they had to be split up in that sense. This might be the first reason why esoteric teachings are found in Tendai today. Either way, by the time his ordinance actually did arrive, Kukai had already returned again, 806, but for his part, Kukai was not received as well as Saicho had been, and was not allowed to enter the capital for several years. This had a lot more to do with the Emperor Heizei at the time. Suffice it to see, there, there's political intrigue. Kukai's uncle uh, was a tutor of Heizei's uh, younger brother, and Heizei was fearful of a, an attempted coup by his younger brother. So, of course, anyone, any association to the younger brother was right out, thus Kukai. So, that aside, um, it's not until uh, uh, eight, 809, a couple of years later, with the advent of Emperor Saga, who came, comes after uh, Heizei, and they become fast friends. Um, and so it's, the, it's that point where uh, Kukai now it gets um, installed as priest at the same temple at which the original 
ordination initiation platform was built that SciShow initiated only a couple of years previously. Now Kukai is put into that position. Um, and, and thus capital, uh, catapulting Shingon into vast um, uh, broad sphere of influence. And Saicho and Tendai fall off out of favor accordingly. Again, at this time, Saicho's focus was on developing temples on Mount Hiei and establishing his Bodhisattva vows, the 10 major and 48 minor, minor precept vows. The political and social demands for esoteric teachings and ritual demonstrated what little Saicho had actually learned in China. There, there's actually, again, a little aside, the story is that weather was the only reason why Saicho might have gotten that esoteric initiation. That inevitably travel plans were waylaid and those two monks happened to be in the same place at the same time. And hence he got initiated into the Kongokai, the diamond womb mandala. But that's it. And so now he comes back to China with not enough. And Kukai comes back with a lot more. Yeah. So now, based on this understanding that he doesn't quite have enough, he has to uh, uh, kind of uh, humble himself and then actually ask Kukai to become a student of his and ask that a few of Saicho's ordinance come and study with Kukai as well. That, that takes a lot. And so because Sancho really needed the information and Kukai knew that he had the authentic transmission. He had the teachings, the implements, he had everything. He had the upper hand on the one thing the court really wanted. Kukai also felt that the Mikyo teachings should stand alone rather than be integrated within another school. Whereas Sancho wanted to include them being equal to the other forms of practice. So when Saicho tried to um, borrow written teachings on, under, his, under Kukai's tutelage, Kukai rejected the request, stating that Tendai could no longer use Mikyo teachings from texts alone. It had, to, and it had always been an oral teaching. And if Saicho was not going to present himself in person, then their communication was cut off and one of Saicho's ordinance even defected and joined Kukai. And this is where things start to seemingly divide between the two schools. Later, the division would spur what would become the distinctions of Taimitsu and Tomitsu, and a little more on that in a, in a second. But in the end, or maybe it's just the beginning, both of our protagonists achieve their goals. A year after Saicho's death, 823, Enrakuji was formally recognized, and now also his codified Buddhist vows and being first administered and thus establishing Tendai's autonomy from the Nara system. By 830, Shingon is publicly recognized and included as part of the Nara set of teachings, equating it with Hoso, Kegon, Ritsu, Sanran, and at, by then, Tendai teachings. And in 835, Shingon receives their first three ordinance. And off they go into history. But I wanted to point out a few particulars. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a too far. That guy? That guy. Was I, too, was I one slide too, too far? Sorry. Um, what I wanted, to, a few particulars, because from this trip, a few notable outcomes uh, can be identified. These are other than the fact that both Tendai and Shingon schools were formed out of this trip, which is a feat in and of themselves. Um, I first want to point out specifically the Bodhisattva precept vows Saicho had developed. He, he felt that if practitioners were to be Mahayanists, they should take Mahayanist vows, not the Vinaya vows, the traditional Pali canon vows. This was a big item of contention at the time. That, that's why it took up most of his life. He was going against precedent and all of Nara Buddhism. The rigid structure did not take well to being told that things needed to be changed. But to Saicho, this was a pivotal step 
in establishing Tendai outside of the Nara system. He wanted Tendai practitioners to be Tendai, to be followers of the Mahayana, of the Ekayana teachings of the Lotus Sutra. Subsequently, it took his death to get an imperial decree authorizing the new vows and establishment of Enrakuji. The other I want to mention is a note about the word esoteric, because I certainly used it a lot in this discussion. It was Kukai that started the differentiation of what the term Mikyo or esoteric actually means. Generally, esoteric implies tantric or Vajrayana practice, the use of mudras, mantras, and visualizations unifying the Sanmitsu, the body, speech, and mind. Under this Vajrayana umbrella, the concepts of Taimitsu and Tomitsu took shape. These two together have been termed Japanese Esoteric Buddhism, Japanese Vajrayana, Japanese Tantric Buddhism, Japanese Tantrism. Taimitsu and Tomitsu originating within Tendai and Shingon respectfully, have been somewhat fluid taxonomies, each having influenced the other over time. But generally speaking, they denote esoteric lineages and perspectives. From a Shingon perspective, there is only Tomitsu, of which Taimitsu would be an offshoot. And this stands to reason since many later Tendai thinkers used Kukai and Shingon teachings to develop Tendai uh, esotericism. But some of the main differences between the two lineages lay in perspective. Taimitsu is seen as part of the Tendai teachings, not the sole teaching, as it is in Shingon's Tomitsu. You've also heard a distinction in the past when we talk about the Taizokai and Kongokai mandalas. We've talked about, from a Tendai perspective, how Entering into the mandalas is, in a Tendai perspective, coming from compassion first, Taizokai, then into wisdom, Kongokai. And in Shingon, being more Yogi Charan, it's first wisdom, Kongokai, then into compassion, the Taizokai. The point here is to say that distinguishing practices and teachings as esoteric on, on the whole and how that magic could help wield transformative powers actually helped fuel a cultural acceptance <coughs> and propagation of Buddhism on the whole in Japan. One could also argue that Shinto gained back and solidified itself with the advent of esoteric teachings. Folk shamanism and magic became more legitimized and utilized within the developing culture, thus ensuring its long-term societal relevance. Gardner, uh, Gardner um, Dave Gardner, he wrote a, an article on Tantric Buddhism in Japan. It's a great title, Tantric Buddhism in Japan, Shingon, Tendai, and the Esotericization of Japanese Buddhisms. It's a great article. Um, but he talks about just that. <clears throat> he states that with the use of esotericism and the reliance upon it, all future developments of Japanese Buddhism and culture were now always to be marked by as aspects of esoteric teachings. So there's obviously a lot to cover. Um, so I could go into all of that, maybe in a future discussion, but the contributions that Kukai and Saicho had on starting Japanese Buddhisms would go on to leave an indelible mark on Japanese history and culture. They cannot be understated and are way too numerous to count. One cannot separate the influences each had on the other. Tendai and Shingon influenced the culture and society of Japan, just as the culture and society influenced Shingon and Tendai. Many times I hear that Tendai is too Japanese. Well, yeah, 
But maybe Japan is very Tendai. <laughs> right? That's kind of what, so it's hard. We can't just separate the two. Okay. And what I want to make a finer point here is that what has me wondering, what if our culture that truly allowed for mysticism, allowed for transformative powers, for esotericism, it was bred out of our cultural perspective. But what if it wasn't? Would we be more willing to accept the concept of prayer, devotion, meritorious act, devotional act? Would we have the same judgment or doubt about that? I fear we even doubt the concept of Tatagata Garba, and more specifically in Japan, Hongaku theory, that all phenomena have a seed of awakening. That concept is formative and core belief of esoteric thought. But we still go through life with this idea of, oh, I won't get awakened this time around. <laughs> Or, oh, that's too hard. Or, oh, I'm just doing this Buddhist stuff to be a nice person. <laughs> uh, frankly, I have no idea what esotericism would look like in our culture. But that's why I'm asking. The idea had, had been, has been powerful enough to have lasted since at least the 7th century. So there is something there. What if we had a stronger sense of possibility that esotericism offered. It has, over time, proven to be very soteriological for the Japanese people, for example, meaning it's provided a sense of salvation and solace. I, I remember living at a, a temple in Japan. Uh, the priest was doing his own um, Mikyo practice, the Goma, every morning. Um, but one of the Sangha members came and asked, my, my husband's very sick, can you do the Goma for him? He's unable to attend because he's so sick, but I will attend in his stead. The priest does the Goma, nothing different about it, but with the wife there, present. Now she goes home, tells husband, it's done, and he feels better. Not cured, better, at least, solace. <laughs> okay, sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> there can be more. We could realize more. Personally, I'm grateful for that idea. I'm grateful to Saicho and Kukai that they laid before me a path to awakening that I can trust, that I can follow. Obviously, being a Tendai priest, I, I appreciate more the Taimitsu approach because one does not necessarily have to do esoteric rites to experience esoteric-like outcomes. We do the moonlight meditation on nights of the full moon. We practice the meta meditation. We chant. We practice uh, Pure Land Nembutsu. We even do an esoteric piece in our exoteric daily service. When the priest is up there doing mudras and mantras, that's esotericism in an exoteric ritual. These are major contributions. Saicho and Kukai's work has continued to influence Buddhism, and obviously now across the world. Out of their respective stories come the fruition of a deeper, or at least to me, a more meaningful expression of the Buddha Dharma. From the vows I take, to the practices I do, to the perspective I'm developing. Without these two, without this trip, we would be so much poorer for it. And I will stop there, um, and I might ask before we stop the recording, um, Ichishima Sensei, if you're still there, I feel so embarrassed to be presenting this topic while you are 
so patiently <laughs> observing our conversation. So uh, I would ask if there is anything that you would add about this uh, important trip that Kukai and Sacho made, please. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for introducing Saicho and Kukai. As you mentioned, uh, uh, they are predecessors of uh, esoteric Buddhism. And I think one of the tendencies of Buddhism at that time, 8th century, 9th century, uh, in, even in India, uh, Buddhism becomes very esoteric or tantric arising. And so uh, some priests uh, came to uh, China and uh, taught uh, such esoteric uh, mandala and uh, incantations, uh, mudras, etc., to directories, uh, maybe uh, Kukai and Saicho, etc. So uh, by the time when Saicho arrived in China, well, he, his intention to to visit the China is to get uh, the uh, basic. Uh, what should I say? I, did, oh, I think authentic uh, uh, <clears throat> teachings uh, from Tentai Mountains uh, because of the order of Emperor Kam. But when he arrived, esoteric or tantric Buddhism very spread and very fashionable. So uh, uh, timely, he just received such, you know, uh, Taizokai, etc. mantra. Uh, and and in the case of Kukai, uh, he encounters Keika Ajari. He was a very fantastic uh, esoteric master. But, but, you know, he died uh, within two years, I think, uh, after Kukai uh, visiting China. And uh, at the death of uh, uh, Kukai's teacher in China, Keika, he said, you are the person who spread the esoteric Buddhism, Shingon Buddhism in Japan. So uh, go back to Japan immediately. Although, you know, Kukai had to stay there uh, over 20 years as an order of emperor. But, you know, his uh, teacher, Keika, he said, well, I taught you everything about Tantric. So you go, to ba go back to Japan and spread Shingon esoteric uh, teachings. So, and in the case of uh, Saicho, of course, as you know, exoteric, well, that is uh, Shikam, Shamata Vipassana teachings, and uh, as uh, Tentai GJ uh, expounded, that is a basis, but he added Vairochana teachings. And the, I think Vairochana teachings is also very important to understand uh, such an uh, esoteric thought. And so uh, since that time when he, uh, Saicho came back to Japan, uh, he established the Mahayana Platform Center. Uh, it was a very hard time for him to establish Bodhisattva precept to Japanese people. Because, you know, that time uh, when both leaders arrived, uh, survived, I think uh, the Mapo area, latter days of Dharma. And uh, so uh, uh, it is so or, or difficult for the ordinary people to understand such a, you know, Hinayanistic way of practice. And so Saicho emphasized Mahayana uh, precept is very important. And uh, so he established the Kaidangin at uh, Mount Hie. So, and uh, I think uh, they are pioneering persons who started Japanese Buddhism. Before them, uh, Nara Buddhism there, but as you know, Nara Buddhism, they are just directly imported from Korea. Uh, and uh, uh, so these are uh, traditional teachings, but the new teachings such as Tendai and Shingon, these are foundations of Japanese uh, Buddhism since that time on. And as you know, in Kamakura period, such a Honen, Shinran, and Nichiren spread their Dharma based upon Tendai, uh, I think, the comprehensive studies of Buddhism. So Mount Hie is supposed to be a university to learn Buddhism in general. So I think uh, these two pioneering uh, predecessors of 
very important uh, teachers who uh, taught esoteric and exoteric Buddhism in Japan. That is my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, so we'll stop the recording here and open it up for any questions.